Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar on ADHD, Pearl's Web Presentation, Identification, and Support. Really glad you could make it today. Just starting out with a couple of quick disclosures. Um, no major financial disclosures that we have to report, but on the next slide, you may be able to see just a little bit about um, some of our major funding sources, including California Department of Healthcare Services, as well as HRSA. A um, couple of other announcements on our next slide. Oh, um, I believe there was a quick announcement slides before. Yes, um, just a quick reminder that we are now called CalMAP, not CAP anymore, um, but our phone number and our services are the same. There's our phone number. If you ever have questions about your particular patients, it's a great way to learn how to apply a lot of these skills directly to uh, your patients. And for those of you who don't know yet, we have um, recordings of prior webinars available on demand. Um, that's the link there to sign up. Um, in a minute, I'll drop that into the chat so that you can sign up if you'd like. And it's eligible also for CME, American Board of Pediatrics, MOC Part 2 credit if you like pass these post quizzes. All right. And with that, um, we are very fortunate um, to hear today from our two guest speakers and would like um, to introduce them to you now. Dr. Lauren Hack is an associate professor in UCSS Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. She is a licensed clinical psychologist with interests focused on cultural influences to mental health conceptualization, assessment and treatment, accessible and culturally attuned evidence-based services for the traditionally underserved youth and families worldwide, and finally, provider experience training and consultation. Dr. Hack serves on various UCSF Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Services teams, including serving as the Associate Director for the Clinical Psychology Training Program, as well as serving as psychologist and school consultation team member for the California Child and Adolescent Mental Access Portal, CalMAP, right here. Um, she's also a member of the UCSF Psychology Advisory Committee and co-leads the Research Task Force on the Diversity Committee. In addition, we have Hokwe Eileen Wang, who is a clinical assistant professor in the Division of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry here at UCSF. She provides outpatient care at the UCSF Benioff Children's Hospital Oakland and, and in the Prisker Building in the West Bay. She leads the teaching clinic and works with trainees at UCSF Benioff Children's Hospital Oakland. In addition, she also staffs our um, CalMAP um, advice line and is part of the, this CME team developing educational content um, so she works a lot behind the scenes to help organize our sessions. Her clinical passion lies in treating anxiety, depression, and trauma. Her research interests include medical education, PTSD, sleep, and the gut-brain axis. So before I hand over to our speakers, a quick reminder that we will be reserving the last 10 minutes for Q&A. So if you have any questions for our speakers, please type them into the Q&A section. And with that, I'll turn the platform over to Drs. Hack and Mike. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. Um, here you will see our learning objectives for today. I won't take the time to read through them because we have so much valuable information. And so I wanted to actually start, if we advance the slides, by getting some input from you all. If you could let us know, this is a wait question. So type your thoughts into the chat and then wait to hit send until we say go. When you hear ADHD, what does that bring up for you or what does that mean to you? So go ahead and type your thoughts. And when you are ready, hit send. Okay, I'm seeing hyperactivity, problems in school, impulsive, my daughter, school problems, difficulty concentrating, teenagers who suddenly feel school and attentive, Great, thank you so much for participating. Um, so you can see that's a pretty wide variety of things that people brought up, right? And if we advance the slide, this does indeed reflect that the presentation of ADHD um, can cover a number of different aspects. If we could um, advance the slide. So this is the um, diagnostic criteria of ADHD in the DSM-5, um, our most recent edition. And so to in order to be diagnosed with ADHD, um, someone needs to have at least six symptoms of inattention and or at least six symptoms of hyperactivity impulsivity 
for at least six months before the age of 12. Right. And so this is how you can see some of our some of the things that you brought up were more in this inattention spectrum, like the disorganization, being distracted easily. Sometimes people think of like being daydreamy and kind of lost in the clouds. And then we also have these features of hyperactivity and impulsivity. Um, and sometimes someone will have both features. Sometimes we tend to see less of the hyperactive impulsive symptoms. And as we'll talk about in a moment, this actually can change quite a bit over time, even within the individual. What's really important here, what really distinguishes ADHD as a condition from the spectrum of inattention and impulsivity that we all fall on is this, um, this criterion uh, C, we call it, that because of these symptoms, the individual is facing impairment in their functioning in at least two settings. So with youth, we're usually seeing it at home and at school and or with their peers. Um, and in adults, that translates more to home and uh, work and with their, their friends and partners. Um, and we also need to see that these aren't a result of another condition like trauma or a traumatic brain injury, which we'll talk about more in just a second, how to parse that apart. All right, so let's take a closer look at this clinical impact of ADHD. So when we're looking at children, they're often first identified as maybe having um, a need for ADHD identification when they begin school and or when they start to demonstrate difficulties that interfere with their learning and the learning environment for others. So for example, we know that kids with ADHD often exhibit more negative off-task classroom behaviors such as interrupting instruction, leaving their seat, as well as less positive classroom behaviors, such as academic engagement and focusing, than do their peers. And then in addition, we also see that kids with ADHD may experience more negative relationships with their classmates and their teachers, as evidenced by more noncompliance, sometimes but not always more aggression, as well as some difficulties regulating their emotion. And then these difficulties coupled with the co-occurrence or frequent co-occurrence of learning disorders can really lead children to demonstrate poor academic performance, um, which can um, manifest in lower standardized test scores and report card grades, as well as higher rates of grade retention, dropout, and expulsion. So oftentimes when you are seeing a family come in and express concerns about ADHD, those concerns may have actually initially been raised by the teacher and the teacher may have a really important uh, perspective on how this child is being impacted by ADHD. Um, we do, though, tend to see ADHD manifest in the family or home setting as well. And so we see that um, in general, kids in ADHD Kids with ADHD and their parents tend to have more negative interactions and less positive, warm interactions. And this is really a bi-directional process. It's not because or caused by either one of them, but really by the relationship cycle that occurs. Uh, we see they have a harder time following through on tasks and routines. And as a result, think about in your families, right? When somebody's not following through on their home tasks, that creates conflict, right? And then in terms of social and emotional dysregulation, we see that um, kids with ADHD tend to have a harder time. Um, it might be that they're being actively rejected or bullied, or it may just be that they're sort of being left out, left behind and ignored. They're also more likely to bully others. Um, on the whole, again, not every kid because this disorder really manifests differently in different individuals and over time. Um, and because of actually some, some differential ways that the brain kind of processes and, and pays attention to or um, kind of redirects to certain stimuli, we see that kids with ADHD tend to sort of over attend to negative feedback and under attend to positive feedback. And so something that may seem really minor to any of us in terms of a negative social cue, may, that kid may really get stuck on that and have a hard time uh, redirecting or kind of remembering all of the positive feedback that they're getting. Um, and so this can lead to a really hard time regulating emotions. All right, if we go to the next slide, because of all of the differences in 
brain mechanisms that are related to some of these core domains that we know are impaired in children with ADHD of executive functioning and motivation. As a result, we see that kids with ADHD really need extra support in terms of scaffolding with organization and planning, having really consistent expectations and routines that are realistic, and also frequent labeled praise and rewards, right? So while it may come naturally to someone without ADHD to think, okay, I've got to get out the door this morning. These are all the things I have to do. I have to get up. I have to put my clothes on. I have to brush my teeth. I have to pack my backpack. That can that task and that planning, the executive functioning needed for all of that and managing your time for all of that can be really challenging if there's not a really clear, consistent routine already set up. Also, if I'm starting to get a little bit negative feedback, right? So I'm not doing my routine. We're starting to get late. My mom kind of sighs, really starts to, you know, come on, we got to get out the door. I can get really sidetracked on that negative feedback and really start to take it personally and have a hard time redirecting back to what I'm supposed to be doing. So this is why we really focus on a huge... um, Uh, sort of ratio of praise to corrections, which honestly is helpful for everyone, but is really especially needed for kids with ADHD. We want to be giving at least five praise statements for every one redirection. If we go to the next slide, um, we also see that other domains that are impaired with ADHD in the brain are things like how we process time, um, speech and language, memory span, response time variability, arousal and activation, and motor control. All right, so a question that we often receive, um, I've been working in the field of ADHD for over 15 years now, and one of the most consistent questions I get is like, is this really a real thing? Is ADHD really real? Like, we never had this when I was growing up, even though I was kind of inattentive, like my family in Mexico never talks about this, right? Um, and it has sort of developed this stigma of being sort of a, a white upper middle class American disorder. But if we look to really culturally attuned research, we see that the worldwide prevalence of ADHD is pretty the same, no matter where you come from, about 5 to 15%. But we see variability in terms of um, how much this disorder is identified and treated, right? And this relates to what our cultural beliefs about acceptable and unacceptable behavior from context to context might be, um, as well as structural inequities in healthcare and historical um, discrimination and racism in the medical industrial complex. So going more into that a bit, we know that as a result of unconscious biases, providers do tend to judge and interpret behaviors um, seen in our more behavioral disorders like ODD, oppositional defiant disorder, conduct disorder, and ADHD differently based on the race or ethnicity of the individual being rated putting um, populations that have been historically minor- marginalized at risk for misidentification and then mistreatment. So what we know is when a disorder or a diagnosis of a disruptive behavior disorder is provided in place of ADHD or ADHD isn't included as a concurrent condition, there are significant clinical implications which really limit these children's access to medications, therapy, and other support services. And this can put minoritized children at risk for perpetuating the disparities which currently exist in the medical, educational, and juvenile injustice systems. So it's really important for us to be aware of these um, sort of historical injustices and also be able able to check our bias when we're seeing a patient, when we're seeing a family, like what of my unintentional biases are playing a role at the recommendations that I'm providing and really trying to undo some of this. If we look to the next slide, um, the majority of both boys and girls with ADHD also are going to meet diagnostic criteria for another mental health condition. Um, And 
historically, we see that boys may be more likely to be diagnosed with externalizing comorbidities like oppositional defiant disorder um, and later on conduct disorder and substance use disorder. Um, and uh, girls may be more likely to have been diagnosed with a comorbid internalizing condition like anxiety or depression. And about two thirds of people with ADHD frequently have comorbid psychiatric conditions. As we said, some of the most common include learning disorders, sleep disorders, anxiety, mood disorders, and also uh, tic disorders. Another really common one are toileting disorders like enuresis and encapresis. So again, it's really important to be aware that when you're rating a child for ADHD, there, there's more likely than not something else going on. A question we often are asked is, well, what about trauma? We know that uh, PTSD and other trauma conditions have symptoms that overlap with the symptoms of ADHD. So sometimes a child may be referred for ADHD diagnosis or treatment when really trauma experiences are driving those symptoms. Sometimes a kid may have had traumatic experiences and also have organic ADHD, right? And so really we need to think carefully um, when we're seeing a child, we need to consider trauma, assess for trauma and realize that just because someone has had trauma exposure and experiencing things like ACEs or post-traumatic stress um, symptoms, it doesn't mean that they do or do not automatically qualify for ADHD, right? We really need to be taking both into account and think about did one come first and then the other symptoms are really presenting after? Or is there really a history that organic inattention or impulsivity has been there all along, even before the trauma exposure? So I alluded to this a little bit um, before, but we used to think that ADHD was really this disorder of childhood that kids just grew out of. And what we know is that's not entirely true. However, if we advance the slide to show the graph, we do see that um, most children have experienced a difference in how much their symptoms are impacting them over time. So although we see a lower percentage of the population in adulthood experiencing sort of full criteria ADHD, most children with ADHD are going to have at least some symptom and functional impairment carryover into adulthood, particularly if they're not exposed to services and supports. We really see, though, sort of a natural developmental drop off in that hyperactivity, right, which is why the criteria changes a little bit. You only need to have five hyperactive impulsive symptoms um, in adolescence compared to in childhood. We, we need that six. And then the next slide shows, again, we used to think of, like when I was in graduate school, I was taught the phenomenon of thirds, that if we think about, well, what's going to happen to these kids with ADHD? About a third are going to get better, they're going to get services and supports and really learn to succeed and play to their strengths. About a third are going to kind of stay the same, continue to struggle, and then a third are going to develop more severe problems like um, maybe school dropout, chronic um, unemployment, relationship problems, substance use, problems with the law, um, other health problems like obesity, and even a reduced life expectancy. However, more recent research has shown that that's phenomenon of thirds is, is a little bit simplified. And really what we see is that most people with ADHD tend to have fluctuating, fluctuating periods of remission and recurrence over time, right? So maybe when I first start school, I'm really struggling with my inattention. It's really impacting me. I get some supports, I get some services, and then I get a little bit better. But then that transition to middle school happens and whew, I'm having a bunch of difficulties again, right? And so that tends to be what we see more often than not. The next slide just shows another visual of how ADHD can impact someone in different ways over the course of their lifetime. So, you know, in childhood, maybe we're seeing, um, you know, some difficulties with their family environments, peer influences and work environments. And then later in life, we're seeing that that's translating into work problems, problems with uh, partners, um, and maybe some of these other comorbidities in adulthood. Thank you. 
Dr. Hawk. Um, now we get more of a sense of what ADHD is and how it looks like. We have another weight question here. Um, how do you identify ADHD in your practice? And are there any favorite diagnostic tools that you use? Type in your thoughts in chat um, and then wait. We'll give it a minute um, and then we'll say go and then you'll send, hit send. Okay, now please send, your, send in your questions, uh, send in your answers. So Vanderbilt is definitely very popular um, and asking about sleep, Vanderbilt. And ruling out other medical workup, other medication pro medical problems, sleep issues, um, but just by observing the teenagers or the ch children's behaviors in the clinic with you. Great. And next slide, please. So when accessing ADHD, it's important to remember that there is no single test that can diagnose ADHD, just like all of you have shared, not just by using measurement-based um, rating skills, but also clinical observation, um, getting information from the patient, from the family. The gold standard is a comprehensive inquiry that involves different methods, informants, and also collecting information from multiple settings. This means that neuropsychological testing is not necessary and gathering information through clinical interviews, just talking to the teenager and teen teenager or the children and the family um, caregivers separately to gather um, information from either of their perspectives using um, Vanderbilt or other types of standardized measures and also your own observation is an effective way to diagnose. Um, if we can advance the slide to see the last part, thank you. Um, ADHD symptoms may vary across environments in home, school, and social settings. That's why per DSM-5, symptoms need to be present in at least two different settings to meet the diagnostic criteria. Um, and also um, some other questions that we may ask about would include academic problems, their peer relationship issues, emotional dysregulation patterns, and also any parent-child problems or conflicts. A few questions I often like to get started with um, with my teenagers, children, or families are, how much time do you spend on home working on homework every day? Are you able to wrap up class assignment at school? How often do you turn in homework on time every week? Is it challenging for you to finish chores that's assigned to you at home? Has it been hard for you to follow what's going on when you're playing sports on the field with your peers? Um, or do you think that you spend more or less time to finish your assignments than your peers? So these can be some kind of beginners when you start doing the clinical interview part with the children um, or the teenager. Um, next slide, please. And if you can advance again, thank you. So as you all have mentioned um, and shared in chat that there are a few rating scales commonly used to assess and monitor ADHD symptoms, Vanderbilt being one of the most popular, it includes both parent and teacher forms. I like it just like you guys for a few reasons. First, there are initial evaluation form and follow-up evaluation forms. So you can use it across different time points in during the treatment. Second, it screens not just ADHD symptoms, but also common comorbidities, including behavioral problems and anxiety, which is very common um, as a comorbid issue along with ADHD, and that often requires separate treatment. Um, SNAP4 is another well-like rating scale for its brevity. It only has 26 questions, so it's significantly shorter than the Vanderbilt. And lastly, for adolescents and adults, the adult ADHD self rating scales can be used for 13 and up, although I do find this test tends to overestimate symptoms quite a bit. And um, these are some time points that you can consider completing rating skills, including as start of assessment um, at, at baseline, and then every six months during treatment. Um, and then within the first six months of treatment, you can also consider doing rating skills every time after a change or increase in medication doses or frequency. And also if the patient or parent reported any changes in their medication effect, their behaviors, or they start experiencing side effect, and then you're thinking about changing or um, changing the dose of medication or changing the type of medication that you'll be using. Next slide, please. As Dr. Hogg had mentioned earlier, there are different treatment strategies for um, different age um, for children and adolescents. 
So for preschool age children between four to six, therapy is the first line, um, especially behavioral modifications, some therapy, including um, PMT parenting management training and PCIT parent child interaction therapy are both considered first line treatment. The famous MTA study also shows that younger children benefit most from these behavioral approaches before considering medications because kiddos tend to have more drastic side effects con um, compared with older, older children or um, teenagers. And for school age children, for the six to 12 year old, medication becomes the first line. It's important to maximize medication. Um, my preference is often starting them with short acting, uh, preferably metaphenidate, and you might need to consider consider using BID dosing because they tend to have more symptoms in the afternoon because these medications are short acting, so they often last for only four hours. If they take it at seven or eight, it's pretty much gone after lunch. Um, and then behavior modification is still a key to go along with medication to help them with relationship problems, reducing their anxiety, and help improving their daily functioning. And for adolescents, medication is still a first line approach and often we would then prefer long acting medication once daily formulation just for their convenience because school days are longer and also teenagers are more aware of having to go to um, the nursing office to take the second dose of medication during the day. And that may impact their roots kind of the, the flow of their day or um, their relationship with their peers or friends. Behavior interventions like organizational skills training education, coaching, behavior modification therapy are also essential to address some of the other functional impairments that medication can achieve. And we'll hand it back to Dr. Hawk. Thank you, Eileen. Um, so next we wanna get your feedback, our last wait question, I think. Um, what treatments, resources, and referrals do you all utilize in your practices? So go ahead, type your thoughts in the chat. And when you're ready, hit send. Call CalMAP, I love it. <laughs> Psychiatry, behavior specialist, Clarity Peds, methylphenidate, methylphenidate, CalMAP consults. I love the full circle here. Thank you, everyone. Ritalin. Great. So what I'm really seeing is a, uh, a combination that you all are sending of, of medication and behavioral recommendations with use of CalMAP. Um, we're going to talk about uh, those. We're also going to talk about other supports that um, you might be able to harness, like uh, school-based supports, for example. So let's go to the next slide. Um, so we did want to highlight some um, resources that our team has pulled together. Um, this is part of a newsletter that we distributed to school and school-based health center staff. Um, so here there's some nice links um, about how to give psychoeducation for families. So this is the first step, really, if you're going to, if you, you know, done your screening, you think, yeah, this child definitely looks like they're uh, consistent with a profile of ADHD. How do I present this information back to the family in a way that's going to be tangible, that's not shaming, blaming, that's going to be culturally attuned and also uh, fit their sort of um, background. Chad is a really, really great resource. They've got some free handouts in English and Spanish. Also the CDC and NIMH and childmind.org have some nice guides um, for parents and for teachers. And also Chad has a, a nice tips for low cost service referral. So next slide, I mentioned that really it's helpful to start this conversation with some psychoeducation for the family. Um, and we also have some resources on our site that I'd encourage you to take a look at, um, some other recommendations for how to think about ADHD and kind of talk about this with families um, are included in this slide. Attitude Magazine is another one of my favorites that really distills some of this what can be sort of academic -y language into really parent-friendly terms. And then after you've sort of talked about what is this, um, it's really helpful to provide some behavioral and educational supports because again, these are recommended across the lifespan, right? From young kids on up in combination with medication as they get older. And if we look across the board, because I know I've heard in loud and clear since beginning this CalMAP program, there just aren't enough 
behavioral specialists um, and school supports to meet the needs of all of our kids who need these treatments. So how can you kind of distill some of the magic in these re referrals and resources, even in a brief interaction that you have with your families? Like what is, what's really the important takeaways that we might be able to start getting folks started thinking about if they're waiting for longer term treatment or if we suspect they might because of various barriers never get that um, specialized treatment. So really across the board, we're focused on setting this kid's environment up to provide really clear, consistent and realistic expectations. We're often breaking things down into subtasks and steps, right? And then we're providing really frequent and positive feedback for meeting those expectations, those steps in the right direction. And all of this is really focused on creating more positive interactions in the home and the school setting. Um, oftentimes when families get to your office and ADHD has been diagnosed, we've sort of had a pattern of pretty um, unhelpful and negative interactions. And so we wanna try to try to start to turn that on its head. So these are some examples, if we, just, sorry, go back one, uh, to the slide of some free resources for how to do this at home and at school. So these are an example of a really simple morning routine, which we call a when then, where the parent lays out exactly, these are the steps that are you're expected to do every day at the same time. And then these are the rewards that you get. And you'll see these rewards are not big, expensive things. They're really a lot of times privileges or choices. And we can set the same thing up in the school environment, right? What are like two to three really specific things that the teachers really hope this kid could focus on? And then how could they earn rewards at school or even at home for meeting those expectations? And just to give a shout out, our um, CalMAP team has a therapeutic skills echo, which runs on the fourth Thursday of every month at the noon hour. And we have sessions dedicated to these concepts. The next one is in January and it's focused on these, we call them ABC and behavior plans. And they really are tangible tools that you can start talking to a family about in your office. Okay, now if we advance to the next slide. Um, you know, if you are able to refer a family for more intensive uh, behavioral parent or family interventions, um, really across the board, no matter what name they're given, whether it's Incredible Years or PMT, right, the, all of these evidence-based services have in common that they are designed in the, or they're, they're targeting the chronic nature of ADHD. So remember I show you kids don't outgrow ADHD, but the challenges just sort of change and wax and wane over time. So how can we give the family strategies so that they can help their child as they grow, sort of overcome these challenges as they're manifesting in different ways and in different settings? They're really focused more on the impairment that the symptoms are causing and less on the symptoms themselves, right? Um, and they also can help with these coexisting conditions, like if there's a, um, a disruptive behavior disorder or a mood anxiety disorder, a lot of the strategies are going to also improve those conditions as well right? Uh, really, we're teaching these families lifelong skills for taking control, providing structure, and improving uh, their relationships. So these are some examples of goals that are targeted. We're trying to improve that child's compliance and acceptance of the rules and instructions. We're trying to really bolster their independence and their effective completion of homework and home routines and improve these respectful relationships. We also really are mostly working with the parent and the family actually to do this, right? Until the child is older in adolescence, it's actually not that effective to work directly with the child. It's much more effective to work with the parents and the teachers to, to bolster these supportive environments that are positive and warmth and really consistent in terms of what are our expectations and what are our, our consequences. Um, and interestingly, we know that um, oops, I think that's a, 
excellent outside. We know that these treatments uh, tend to be effective, whether they're uh, delivered individually in a group online. We even have some uh, evidence that self-guided parent training can be helpful. Um, and even the strategies pulled out, right? If you can give them one of these strategies that we talk about in some of our other uh, webinars on parent management training or on uh, positive relationships, if you can do those in, in isolation, we know that they can make a real impact. Um, if we go to the, the next slide, next one. Um, other things that can be touched upon that can be really helpful are parent stress management and helpful thinking. Um, and again, we have some resources here, some videos and handouts that are free that you could give to your families in their office if you feel like this is really impacting. Um, you know, I know personally as a, a mother of a three-year-old and a newborn that when my child isn't following directions, it's really stressful and I can get a lot of mom guilt, right? Like, why is this happening? What am I doing wrong? Um, and that's a very common experience in parenthood in general. And then think about just how much more likely that's going to be impacting a parent if they have a child who has these organic challenges. Um, we can also focus more in on social, organizational, and emotional skills if those are particularly impacted, like say if the child has comorbid anxiety, for example. And then again, as the child gets older into adolescence, we can incorporate more on working on them. How can we teach them organizational skills? How can we teach them social, emotional skills um, that the parents and the teachers can reinforce? My favorite, favorite, favorite tool that I, um, again, we go more into this in the skills um, echo is called the before after model. And you all may have be doing something like this in your practices already, but it's a really nice way to sort of get a good idea of well, what is really in this very moment, the most concerning challenge that this family is having how can we kind of narrow that down into something that's tangible and that's modifiable, right? Not following directions, talking back. This is a real example from one of our CalMAP consults that I did. And then we think about, well, what's happening right before that challenge? Well, usually if he's not following directions or he talks back, it's because he's doing something he likes, like playing video games, and we ask him to stop. Okay, so that's like our setup, our, our, our setting. And then, well, what happens after? Well, sometimes I like say, you're going to lose your video games for a week, but like sometimes I actually don't take them away. Or if it's grandpa, like he doesn't take it away at all. So like we don't actually have a consistent response here. And so, oh, it, it makes sense why the child's continuing to do this behavior, right? It's serving a function for them. Um, so what do we want to happen instead, right? What's the positive opposite of not following directions? We'd like him to follow directions the first time or with one reminder, right? We're trying to be realistic here. So let's give a reminder. How can we set up the environment to make that more likely? Let's set up a routine system so he knows, well, guess what? Every night at four o'clock, screens go off and homework time goes on. We don't have to have a fight and a negotiation about it every day. It's just the set expectation. And can we tie a positive reinforcement to that? Well, every night, if you do that, if you follow the directions with one reminder, it's four o'clock, time to turn off your screen and start your homework. We're gonna give him a reward. And again, usually this is a choice or a privilege, right? Something that's gonna motivate them. So again, this is something that would be emphasized in like full length parent management training that you could actually chunk down and, and accomplish or get the family started on in your visits. Just briefly, we wanna show you a little bit about what can happen at school. Um, that can be effective for these kids. So if we advance the slides, you know, really the rationale for getting schools involved in supporting our youth is that um, these executive functioning and motivational deficits really impair their ability to learn and memorize information and complete assignments, even after we've got a good medication regimen on board. And also the social emotional um, difficulties can also persist even after medication is sort of at a, at a good range. And so we can also kind of harness the school to really focus on how can we enhance this child's study skills and motivation, their behavior and social skills and their academic performance. 
And so, as I mentioned, one of the most helpful, if we advance the slide, ways to do this is called a daily report card, where we're selecting, you know, really specific, um, modifiable, realistic goals for the child. They're getting feedback. Um, and then also things like, can the teacher give reminders, expectations, and cues, and can they redirect and really lay on the positive and try to get away from all the negative? Because these kids get a lot of negative feedback throughout their day, and then they extra focus on them. So we know that children, if we advance the slide, who have uh, ADHD should qualify for um, school accommodations under the IDEA Act. They'll usually qualify under that other health impairment catch-all category on an IEP if their ADHD is impacting their school performance. If they're, if they're not quite at that level, they have ADHD, they could use some accommodations, but they're not, you know, so far behind in school that they're qualifying for an IEP. Other really helpful 504 plan accommodations um, that even can be put into place before a formal 504, like on an SST team meeting, um, or things like a special seat, um, communication plan, work accommodations, maybe they only have to do half of the math problems, not all of them. Um, and as uh, Dr. Young mentioned, we're going to have more talks coming up about these, about how to advocate for these with your patients and talk to the school system and, and break down those silos so that you all are working together to support these kids. Thank you, Lauren. Um, and now we're kind of switch our gear to talking about ADHD medication treatment. ADHD is one of the most treatable mental health disorders. And when it comes to medications, we have several um, options to choose from. The first line is stimulants. There are two main families, methamphetamines and mixed amphetamine salts. Besides that, there are also long-acting alpha-2 agonists like guanfacine and clonidine, which can be either used alone or in combination with stimulants for augmentation. Another option is norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, including uh, atomoxidine, stratera, and a newer medication that was approved in 2020, Velazacine um, Kelbri, which are non-stimulant alternatives. As I mentioned earlier, I prefer starting with a short-acting medication with younger pre-puberty kiddos and gradually work our way up to a longer-acting agent because younger kiddos tend to be more sensitive to side effects and then they can often be stuck with side effect all day with a longer-acting agent for the first time if they are never exposed to stimulants. Either it's appetite suppression, insomnia, feeling sedated, or is it feeling zombie-like when the dopamine levels are too high. And in terms of off-label options, we very often will also use short-acting alpha-2 agonists, such as guanfacine um, IR and clonidine IR, and also um, uh, antidepressant will be trained for specific cases. Lastly, antipsychotics may be used to man manage irritability and severe disruptive behaviors, um, in patients, some patients with ADHD, but they're not a primary ADHD treatment. Next slide, please. Um, and here are uh, a little bit more details about the first line medication choose choice, which is stimulants. These are some common medication choices and the doses, and then also um, how we would increase the dose. So for Adderall, IR, and Vyvanse, you can see the range of medication and also the increments that we usually go by 2.5 to 5 milligram every time when we increase it um, versus for Adderall XR is 5 milligram increment. And moving on to methylphenidates for focaline IR and, uh, oh, sorry, the last slide, please. For focaline IR and Ritalin IR, they're um, titration. So usually we clinically feel focaline is more potent than Ritalin. So usually we increase Ritalin by five, but focaline by 2.5 to five, depends on the patient's response. Next slide, please. And then if you can advance the slide again to see the rest. Um, for stimulants, the effect size is close to one, is highly effective and response rate for the first trial is usually uh, um, often greater than 70%. And then with the second trial of an additional stimulant or a change of stimulant is often reaching over 80% of remission. Um, I have mentioned some of the common side effects, in, including appetite, suppression, um, and sleep disturbances. Also stomach ache and headache are common ones. And then the less common ones are hypertension, tachycardia, sweating, tremors, 
And then the very rare side effects will include um, induced psychosis, induced mania, um, emotional blunting when the dopamine levels are too high. And sometimes patient might report itchiness or compulsive skin, skin picking, which is related to dopamine level as well. Next slide, please. Um, as Lauren had mentioned, some of the cultural, um, culturally informed diagnostic strategies and also understanding how ADHD present differently in different races and cultures. Um, in terms of our treatment consideration, there are also a lot of um, things that could look differently in different, um, a diverse patient population. So um, Lat Latinx, Black and Asian children are less likely to be diagnosed with ADHD and also they are less likely to receive treatment for it than white children. For instance, only 16% of Asian children are diagnosed compared to 32% of white children and a similar gap does exist in prescription rates for ADHD medication. And you can see from the graph in the left, um, the disproportionate numbers of diagnoses and disproportionate um, ADHD medication prescription filled by their providers are similar in terms of the races uh, for each, e each race. Um, there are several barriers that prevents equitable care, including lack of support, cultural factors, limited resources, and access issues. To overcome these challenges, caregiver experience with ADHD can be very helpful, like a family member who have experiences with ADHD or had taken ADHD medications or treatment, support from healthcare systems, from providers, and also from school, and also having access to linguistically and culturally tailored services can be helpful and act as facilitator to help these populations to access treatment. Um, and importantly, using measurements, evidence-based measurements like Vanderbilt, SNAP4, can also help us address biases in diagnosis and continuously care for this population. Um, a little bit more um, background to why ADHD can look different and also has such a drastically different rate of being diagnosed. Um, for Black and Hispanic cultures, in some cases, there is a liar, higher likelihood for providers to attribute some of these ADHD-related behaviors to social or environmental factors such as stress or trauma, rather than seeking underlying neurodevelopmental conditions like ADHD or autism. Additionally, mistrust of the healthcare system due to historical discrimination and marginalization may lead to hesitation for them to seek mental health. Um, for Asian cultures, there is often a greater emphasis on self-control and discipline, as well as academic achievement. And hyperactive uh, hyperactivity and impulsivity may be viewed by parents as a failure to meet their cultural expectation. So these interpretation magnifies the sense of stigma and shame in the family. And in turn, care, care, caregivers might not be enthusiastic to seek intervention or diagnosis for these um, symptoms that they notice. And then instead, they might interpret interpret these behaviors as something that can be managed within the family or hiring more tutor, having more time in cram schools to get these symptoms being rectified. Next slide, please. Um, speaking about um, second line treatments, alpha-2 agonists are another treatment option for ADHD, um, particularly helpful for hyperactivity, impulsivity, sensory sensitivity, and insomnia. These medications stimulate alpha-2 adrenergic receptors, and they're more effective for hyperactivity and impulsivity than for inattention. Based on the 2014 meta-analysis, both um, extended release clonidine and guanfacine were superior to placebo. Um, and usually clinically, I keep in mind that clonidine is more sedated than guanfacine. So I usually try guanfacine first. And if the kiddo can tolerate it and sometimes even need something that's more sedative, for bedtime, then I will say clonidine as the second line for um for those um, for those uses. The most common side effects of alpha agonist are dizziness, lightheadedness, fatigue, and sedation. So I usually start to dose at bedtime, and until when the patient gets more used to it, then we move it to daytime. Next slide, please. Um, and here are two. Um, next slide, please. And here are two um, medications that are NRIs, um, non-epinephrine 
um, reuptake trans trans transporter or um, re reuptake inhibitors. Um, Adamoxidine is Stratera and Vilazacine is um, Calbri. As we talked about earlier that they're similar, they're both um, more similar with antidepressants, but now both being approved for um, ADHD treatment. They're more helpful for hyperactivity and impulsivity than inattention. The effect size is not as big as stimulants, so we save it as a second line. Um, some differences between the two, adamoxidine start working from week three to four versus veloxacine tends to work faster. And also the dosing, a lot of pre pre prescribers feel veloxacine is easier to prescribe because there are only four doses versus adamoxidine is um, slightly more complicated. It's weight based and um, patient often will describe that they have a lot of side effects with GI issues, um, stomach ache. Um, we, although these medication Velocicine was approved for depression before in the UK, and then the approval was discontinued. Um, and atomoxidine, atomoxidine, astratera was developed as a SSRI, uh, SNRI, and then is now not used as an antidepressant either. Um, they're not effective treatment for anxiety and depression. So I wouldn't use them for a comorbid case with both ADHD and anxiety or depression. Instead, we will usually try to um, maximize their anxiety treatment slash depression treatment and ADHD treatment separately with first-line medications. And if patients really don't have good effect with first-line treatments or cannot tolerate first-line treatments due to side effects, then we'll consider medications like adamoxidine or filoxazine. Next slide, please. And here's a general kind of chart to conclude how to manage and monitor side effects during treatment. Um, and I separate them into three different phases. So for pre-treatment screening, you'll screen through their personal and family history and also contraindication. Um, these are not absolute contraindications, so it's important to gather information about the timeline and also the severity and also get specialty clearance. And for ba baseline assessments, we will often get patients' blood pressure, heart rate, um, height and weight at beginning, and also get obtain Vanderbilt parents' teacher's form, and also for adolescents 13 and up, we would do ASRS. Um, and then regarding symptom monitoring during treatment, we'll check blood pressure and heart rate every three months, height and weight every six months, because these are often impacted by stimulants. Um, and also, as we talked about earlier, the timing of administering rating scales, um, either when there's a dose change or a behavioral change or um, every six months after treatment. Um, and also monitor their symptoms closely, review dose regularly, and also titrate and maximize the dose until patient cannot tolerate it is very important because more than often that we notice the problem of continuous symptoms is because the stimulant dose is really not optimized. Next slide, please. Okay, so we're at the end of our presentation and just wanted to highlight some comorbidities. It's very common for ADHD to be comorbid with other conditions. Um, we don't have time to go over all of them today. So just wanted to highlight two that are more kind of tricky or complex in some ways and also harder to kind of distinguish at first. They are ADHD and or anxiety, and also ADHD and autism. Um, when we're seeing patients who are more complicated with um, two or more comorbid diagnoses, it's always helpful to gather in-depth history, get in a timeline, thinking about the mnemonic O cards to get a clear um, kind of characteristics of the symptoms. Um, there are some examples for patients with comorbid conduct symptoms. What would it look like? For patients who have comorbid learning concerns, often their symptoms only are present in certain subjects, and um, educational testing can be helpful for us to tease apart the complexity. Also, it's important to consider history of trauma because PTSD and ADHD often have overlapping symptoms. And then finally, um, for kiddos who have comorbid ADHD and ODD, treating and maximizing ADHD treatment um, can often be helpful for ODD symptoms. And then over time, their ODD symptoms will even diminish. Next slide, please. Um, and then if you can just keep advancing the slide towards the end to show all of the questions and answers. Um, here are some questions and answers in terms of considering medication choices 
for comorbid conditions. Um, generally speaking, for patients who are very anxious, I will try to kind of figure out what is the driving source of the symptom. Is it severe ADHD, so a patient is very anxious because their school performance is poor, or is it actually underlying untreated anxiety that makes people appear very distracted and, and making it hard for them to even sit still because they're so anxious and having um, frequent panic attacks. Um, and for anxious patient, if you do feel their ADHD is equally important and severe, then often I would prefer using short-acting methylphenidate because it tends to have less side effect on um, anxiety um, issues. Adderall tends to increase anxiety symptoms in the beginning. So a lot of times patients who have comor comorbid anxiety will report that they feel more restless and antsy with Adderall. Next slide, please. And then the last slide is um, ADHD and autism. Um, just wanted to highlight for this population, they're very sensitive to side effects. So often we'll definitely consider starting a stimulant for severe cases who are older than six with no severe tics or stereotypes, psychosis, mania, severe anxiety, panic attacks, has more normal weight and is able to eat and have a healthy intake because it does impact their appetite. Um, common medications co considerations are similar to general populations, except for antipsychotics. They are also risperidone, aripiprazole, abilifier are also FDA approved for um, autism related irritability. So in this group of combined ADHD and autism, we more likely will consider antipsychotics for irritable and um, severe irritability. There's some mixed data for amantadine, more success with ADHD symptoms, um, lower effect size for autism, but um, it can be saved as a off-label kind of later last line choice um, as a adjunct. Um, fish oil is another complementary agent that's often uh, recommended. It could be helpful for ADHD um, and attention symptoms and hyperactivity. Um, next slide, please. And I think these are just um, two slides that conclude our talk from today um, in a more visual way to go through a Flow chart depends on the patient's age and um, the different services they can try. And if we can keep advancing the slide, this is a conclusion from our talk from today. And then we're we have just a few minutes to take questions. Wonderful. I know that people are going to have to start going. So um, Rita, if you could go ahead and pop up our QR code for people to check in um, to be in order to be able to get CME credit for today and to drop that link into the chat. We're not going to have time for all the questions that have come through, so I'm going to prioritize a few simpler ones. Common issue, weight loss on stimulants, any quick tips for helping those kids who just are losing weight or can't gain weight when they're, when they're on ADHD stimulants? Um, Joanne, sorry. Um, is this question in the Q and A? Yes, it is. Uh, this was actually in the chat, but um, that person had to go. But I think this is probably the most common thing that we encounter when we actually start stimulants: is kids starting to lose weight. So, yeah. any tips that you have for helping kids who are losing weight or having difficulty gaining weight? Right. So, drug holiday on the weekends, winter break, and summer break. Definitely try that, and that's widely and highly recommended for anyone who has severe appetite suppression. Um, besides that, you can definitely um, provide them tip sheets to make sure that they do three meals and three snacks. If they cannot mm -hmm. keep up, then at least do the snacks. Um, do very much bigger breakfast and dinners mm -hmm. um, to make up for that lunch appetite, the, the suppressed lunch appetite. And the other thing you can try is to... Um, uh, Sorry, I lost track of my thoughts because I know that the person has to go. Well, they they did. So drug holidays and then adding on some snacks. Um, is there anything else you'd recommend on top of those things? Um, for holidays, adding snacks and then bigger breakfast and dinner. Bigger yeah. breakfast and dinner, for sure. Um, yeah, and calorie supplementation that way. Question came through due to your recommendation on why use short acting BID methylphenidate for younger kids instead of just jumping to a longer acting medication for any school age child. This was mentioned in the talk that um, because long acting agents tend to have all day side effects. So zombie like feelings, 
feeling drowsy, sedated, um, appetite suppression and insomnia tend to be more severe for this age group. So in general, the younger they are, the more you might want to think about short acting. And as they get older, they're more likely to be able to tolerate the longer acting medication. And along those lines, somebody had asked, um, there, she had heard a recommendation that alpha agonists be started for preschool and kindergarten age over stimulants. And would you want to speak to when medications are necessary in this younger age group, would you do alpha agonists over stimulants? So alpha agonists and stimulants are both approved for six and up. Um, so there, if we just look at FDA approval, there's, there's really no preference. Um, for very severe cases, I will consider both. Um, I think guanfacine and clonidine often are preferred for younger than six because younger kiddos with ADHD often will have sleep issues as well, having a hard time before bedtime, jumping around, moving around. So often we will use that um, to cover insomnia symptoms as well. Wonderful. And um, one last question about the frequency of follow-up, especially for an adolescent that you've started on ADHD meds, but in general, how often should we be following them up in clinic? The first six months is usually monthly, and that's what we would recommend for doing um, Vanderbilt or SNAP for. Um, after the first six months, if the medication doses have stabilized, you can space it out to every three to six months or even every year after that. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. We are at the top of the hour. Thanks to both Dr. Wang and Dr. Kat for this great talk today. Thanks for all of those who were able to attend today. Please be sure to check in to be able to get credit. Our apologies for not getting to all of these wonderful questions. Um, I did make note of these. And so to the extent we can, we'll try to follow up by email with the questions that we weren't able to directly answer today. And with that, we hope to see you next time in two weeks as we're talking about parent training and behavior management, which fits very well with today's topic. Thanks again. Goodbye.